Hi, Raymond. Welcome Ooh. to our PhotoWorks um, conversation. Um, really lovely to see you again and um, excellent to reconnect. We first met at Houston Photo Fest, didn't we, two years ago and have uh, been super fan of your work and been following your practice since then and had the chance to reconnect at Houston again this year with the with the yes. launch of your book and the exhibition as well. Um, so my name is Louise Fedotov Clements. I'm the director of PhotoWorks. PhotoWorks is um, the UK's leading um, development organization for photography um, and we're Arts Council MPO and we support and facilitate the development of photography from all perspectives of the ecosystem um, nationally and internationally. We have a festival, we produce annual publications, we organize fellowships and residencies and open calls. We're an opportunities focused organization geared towards um, enabling um, living and working practitioners and aspiring practitioners to enter into a kind of practice their creativity with photography as a focus. But the types of photography that we work with is extraordinarily diverse and um, we produce exhibitions and um, all sorts of programs. So check out our website, photoworks.org.uk um, to find the opportunities. Um, so Raymond is, is participating with us at the moment as part of a digital residency, which is a program where we select um, really inspiring artists to work with us to share about their practice from a, a multi disciplinary perspective from sharing how you survive and how you work as an artist through to the books that you find inspiring through to um, talking about specific projects that you're working on. Um, and so it's kind of a 360 perspective on your work life and practice as a as a creative. So we're really proud to have you with us as part of that program. Um, hence our conversation today where we you know, really love you to, to kind of expand about your work and tell us about your your practice awesome. as well yes awesome so, look forward to it definitely um, happy to introduce yourself that'd be fantastic yeah so again uh, my name is raymond thompson jr i am an artist um you know visual journalist and educator like a long title <laughs> just all the things that i do i'm um, in my practice i'm currently based in austin texas where i teach um oh, Sorry, <laughs> where I teach um, at the University of Texas at Austin um, in the School of Communication. So I teach in like a photojournalism um, department in that space, which is pretty new. I just started that job three years ago. Before then, I was doing my MFA um, and also working as like a content producer for West Virginia University, like doing video work and photo work for them. Yeah, so a pretty diverse kind of background of I'll yeah, no, my background is all over the place. <laughs> um, <laughs> my background, I, I started, um, you know, started as a photojournalist for, I was a photojournalist probably for seven years and still am kind of doing that work or I am in, in that work. I don't produce it as much, but I am like in that space. I teach in that space. Um, but then from there, I went into marketing and communication. So that sort of went into the sort of advertising PR world for a bit. And then I stumbled into art. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so my my practice is a little bit of all of those things. Yeah, you can see the roots in from from a variety of perspectives, isn't it? As well as the research and the storytelling and working with narrative and yeah. and, and text combined as well, isn't it? Um, so what we asked you to do today is is I suppose highlight a couple of of projects or kind of give us an introduction, um, visually also to to your practice. Um, so I understand you prepared a a small set of yes. slides and yes. um you've kindly you. zoomed in from your hotel room hope you don't mind yes, us sharing very, that i'm on a book tour at the moment so i'm traveling and on the road um let's go to start All right um great yeah so like i have kind of like this powerpoint you know shows a sort of trajectory of the stuff i've done um, starting with probably the biggest photo journalism project that I did called Justice Undone, which was essentially trying to, um, I was trying to show the ways in which mass incarceration were impacting um, communities and families, because um, so much of the imagery around prison and incarceration is focused on people behind bars, like after things have happened already. 
um, I wanted to sort of look at the impact of what happens when so many people from certain communities are losing people to prisons, what's left over. Um, so this is a set of pictures, like a couple pictures from that project that I did probably about 2010 or 2012 I was working on this project. Um, actually, I was just doing my MA in journalism um, while I was doing, this is my thesis work um, for that. So this is a picture of like Beverly Brown, um, who she she was sort of like the matriarch of a family who I was following. Um, she represented like three generations of incarceration because her she watched her brothers be incarcerated, then her grandchildren, then her children, and then finally was left long enough to see her grandchildren incarcerated. Um, this is a, a picture from a juvenile justice facility in New Orleans. Um, and I have one more from a picture in Appalachia, uh, a double exposure that I made while doing um, this like seven hour prison bus trip uh, for families who wanted to go visit loved ones. And I was able to accompany them and document the trip to uh, from like, like uh, from Richmond, Virginia, seven hours all the way to Appalachia to where the prisons where their family members were held. Um, I'll, should I keep going? She, yeah, so, okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, so in the next from the big, so that project sort of pivoted me into working, um, well, long story short, 2016, um, we, we get a president in the United States and I became very disillusioned with uh, what I thought photojournalism could do. So I began looking for other ways to work. Um, and one of the first things I tried to do was to, I, I'd gotten really fascinated with this idea about the Black experience of the United States, the environment, nature, and I wanted to try to understand it in some way. And the first attempt was to sort of think about like, well, how do people experience nature? Um, a lot of that was coming from the fact that I grew up outside Washington, D.C. And I very, like, we didn't really do woods, like we didn't go out to outdoors very much. We went to parks, but we didn't go camping, hiking. This wasn't a part of my experience as a young person. And I found that it could be a common experience amongst African-Americans. And I was trying to ask that question of why, like why was it that folks aren't um, out in the woods as much or not imagining themselves in those spaces, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so there was, you know, there was, yeah, there's a lot behind it details about that but essentially I wanted to create images that I had never seen before <laughs> which was simply black people in the woods and how what kind of spaces were you going to with it which is um did you go far into into the did you take people with you uh, not even, people yeah, who are out in nature yeah I was living in West Virginia so um it would have to go that far <laughs> <laughs> it's like um the woods are all around so sometimes it would be on the hiking trail or it's in a neighborhood and, you know, I was super, you know, I was thinking about um, the the importance of the tree within Black life in America, um, specifically around the histories of lynching and the history of like lynching postcards and photographs. And um, I, I got there because basically I went to go, when I went to do my Google search to find these uh, black people recreating in the woods. I, I first thing I came across was a lynching photographs. <laughs> so it's like this is the first thing I see. Um, so this picture is like a direct response to that. Like uh, these pictures, I was like, I wanted to put pictures of black people in trees, enjoying the trees. Uh, I wanted to ask them about how they felt in these spaces. So it was like a pretty simple project for me um, to do. And this was my first foray really into like fine art work or fine art portraiture. And I suppose around kind of the the narratives of um, um, addressing exclusion or, or kind of addressing um, or redressing changing narratives of of, of black bodies in in nature, you find yeah, it was, uh, I mean, was received one, by others as well. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. It was one was just trying to. Um, you know, envision, like, you know, to imagine yourself in the spaces and what does it mean to you to re, to re, to um, sort of reclaim a bit of it, but also to get to the point that like, not all, not a group of people aren't a monolith, right? They are not all the same. They don't all share the same experience or feelings about a space. 
Like I went in like, oh, I'm terrified of these spaces, but I met people who love it, right? Who like love coming here. It's just so good for me. I feel alive when I'm in these spaces. So the experience was like all over the place too. So it's both uh, like trying to, to navigate all that, but mostly for me, I just wanted to be able to Google uh, black people in trees and <laughs> in the woods and not find <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, so that was like the main goal yeah. <laughs> even though I know I can't actually, I can't actually put an impact in that uh, for a lot of reasons but I, I just yeah. I wanted to, like this is my my naive trying to address that yeah <laughs> um uh, the next project uh is called Appalachian Ghosts which I'm still in West Virginia and I'll zoom through this uh, faster, but you know, uh, it, the project is made up of a couple of different bodies of work. They're all related, um, using reenactments, um, using archival images, and using landscape uh, to sort of try to expand on the Hawkins Tunnel disaster, which happened in West Virginia in the 1930s. And essentially, like 5,000 people went to build a, a tunnel um, to divert a river. And while they're digging that tunnel into the mountain, they came across uh, a, a chunk of silica rock yep. because they're using like improper drilling techniques, you know, drilling into this rock kicked up the silica dust. And when you breathe that in, you get silicosis. And it's thought roughly, you know, 800 of those people who were working in the tunnel passed away from silicosis, silicosis exposure. And my issue was that like this happened in the landscape today, there's almost no mention of what happened in the space. Um, there's a visual archive that sort of excludes the voices of um, the folks in the space. And the majority of the folks were like African-American as well, like two thirds of the workers were African-American. And I want to again reclaim, it's another thing trying to reclaim, trying to expand using the threads that are in the archive to um, um, to create a, a, a set of work based on that. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you say reenactment, was that with um you manifested that reenacting yeah. process? Like yeah. um the dust is most of most of the images with like are completely like reenacted like in studio or in my backyard. <laughs> I would set up a back backdrop in the backyard, which is the best way to do it because if you do it indoors, it's very dusty and you'll never be able to clean it. Um yeah. so I set up a studio in my backyard or you know, sometimes in a studio space with with uh, some flour and a squeeze bottle. And I, I, you know, had people dress up as if they were workers, tried to find some tools or sort of find some elements that looked like tools or in archival photographs I was working from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they began to make these, uh, these images to try to, you know, to expand on, you know, my, my whole point was always to create some sort of book um, to include these images with archival images, just to expand on the conversation around the hostile tunnel disaster. Yeah. You know, um, and then and so using archival materials to um archival images and you know appropriating that stuff appropriating text and letters ex that explain how what was happening in the tunnel to make this piece the strip they call the race um another part of the project is called tonalitis which was inspired by a, a poem by Mel ruckheiser um that just basically says the people came out of the tunnel you know both black and white everybody was covered in dust and dust was white <laughs> so um i was wanting to imagine like what was like what that looked like to leave that tunnel at night and you know have that dust covering your body um the dust also covered foliage uh that pretty badly around the tunnel portals so i just you know was trying to working primarily in the studio um, to make images that sort of spoke to these archival materials I was finding and other stories I was finding. Yeah, such an extreme trauma for, for that community. And, and um, how, how was it working with the, where is the archive held and how did you find kind yeah. of more? The archive is that? held at the West Virginia State Archive um, Culture Center. Um, and basically it's like, you know, there's 200 pictures to, um, I was, I was primarily working in the visual archive. Um, so I wanted to see what stuff looked like. And, and there is a collection of about 200 photographs, um, that were all made by, uh, a, a subsidiary of Union Carbide. Um, and essentially what they did was they made photographs and they used them to document their, their construction process. Um, but of course they were capturing the workers occasionally. And there's a couple images that show like it's a group portrait of workers inside the tunnel. It's actually one of the few pictures inside the tunnel itself. Um, 
And it was in those images that I really sort of fixated on um, that inspired the dust and inspired tunnelitis. Um, but again, it's also the idea that uh, the archive, especially that archive was the only way we could understand visually what happened. But that same archive was made for another purpose, right? It was made to document the process to prove the company was doing what it was supposed to be doing. Um, and it was never about the people. And this project for me was trying to redirect that archive to the people. Yeah, and so extremely different from from today, where we've got this hyper hyper documentation of of, mm. of all things that occur almost. Yeah, very different. It's shared. So little it's materials <laughs> sometimes um, for all kinds of reason why we did, we don't keep or what we decide to keep that what sure. ends up in our archive. Like even the fact that it was kind of like it was by luck that those pictures even were you know got to the state archive you know it was just someone found them and said oh this belongs in the archive it's sitting in the closet <laughs> yeah and then like you know will the state take this and the state takes it like it could have been as easy still sitting in that closet and we would never have this yeah Amazing. yeah Weird. um yeah so in the last part of the project is 12 men um which is uh appropriating small bits of those pictures that I found and uh, blowing them up very large to like 72 by 48. Um, very influenced by Carrie Mae Weems' work. Um, I, from here, I, I always butcher, because <laughs> it's a long time from here, I saw and I cried. And don't, don't quote me on that. But um, uh, how she worked with those images, the reappropriating of archival images meant to do something else to do another purpose to make it about the people and not the archive that they were trapped in. Yeah, um, and it absolutely serves up with the physicality of the kind of more sculptural, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sculptural images, isn't yeah. it? What's the yeah, scale so of these? Are they, they like They're like, um, so I'm going to keep talking in inches because uh, <laughs> 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 they're, uh, they're, I think they're roughly three meters by like a meter, probably. Right. Mm -hmm. Roughly. So they're pretty big. They're like, human size yeah um some you know so they're like they're very they're kind of intimidating in a way it's like when i first made them i first printed it out on like a piece of paper um before i had them mounted to poster board um like i was hanging in my studio in grad school and like hanging it in a, par a place and like watch people like walk by it and it's behind them and they would see it at the corner of their eye and they were like <laughs> they started to <laughs> wig out slightly and I was like, oh, people are like really getting, they're like getting people that you frighten by this figure. And, the, you know, and I was like, there's something, there's something to that. So it's like, I needed to like, keep doing that. So I, you know, even though these figures are very like, you know, really small digital file, very pixelated, very noisy, uh, but they're still like, depending on the distance from where you stand from them, there, there's a lot of uh, like your brain, if you stand very close, there's nothing to see but noise. And as you move further away, like you can begin to pick out details and facial expressions and posture. Yeah, but there's Which something that... ingrained in our primitive periphery vision, mm -hmm. isn't there, around the, the shape of mm -hmm. the movement or the, the shape of a human figure as well. So it's, it's, kind of, it's yeah, super yeah. convincing and compelling, isn't it? Yeah. Unless it gives another dimension for, for people seeing the work to engage on an emotional more emotional physical level yeah um maybe i, I think i have too many pictures here <laughs> this is a picture <laughs> <of the book. laughs> um from there i did a set of pictures uh called the trauma of white light which is uh reappropriating um farm security administration photographs um, to uh, to in cool for printing them onto uh, tobacco leaves that I grew, um, and this project was kind of like my my pandemic project when I was um, in the last year of my three year grad program and couldn't go to the studio, <laughs> um, and I couldn't travel to like a lot of my work and now is pretty place based. Like I like to go to the places where I'm working, um, but I couldn't go there. So I had to go to another archive to see what this place looked like during a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And all these images are focusing on North Carolina um, and then in the 1920s, 1930s. And I was researching, trying to, I had just started this research of trying to understand what my grandfather's life was like in North Carolina when he was coming up as a boy and about the communities where he was from during that time, which led to later work. But this was like the first part of that was visual research 
um, looking at uh, like what simply what did it look like in these spaces? And FSA accepted photographers to cover that in, in, in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, I had talked to my family about uh, like what they knew about my grandfather and they thought that he would have possibly grown tobacco and or cotton. Um, so it's like, hmm, I need tobacco plants. I need a tobacco leaf. So I decided to, I don't think, do I have a picture? Of, oh, no, I, I erased it. And, uh, yeah, I, have a, I don't have the picture, but I just, you know, grew tobacco in my yard. Uh, and then eventually, like, just before I realized I was going to cool for print them, but then I like, uh, someone pointed me to Ben Dong's work. And then I was like, okay, let me see if I can figure out how to uh, use the leaves to, and print on top of them. Um, yeah. So did you print with with inks on top of the leaves specifically as well? Yeah, no, you use score for printing, uh, you know, digital negative. Yeah. Positive. So not actually, it's actually a digital positive on top of a leaf on a contact frame in the sun, like in West Virginia and um, in the sun for like 24 hours of actual exposure. So it needed a good amount of time in certain positions with the sun um, to get the leaf to actually expose. And it's yeah. only fun to five cent because it really, the leaf had to be at a certain peak, a certain time where they're really great. And then later on, they began to sort of, uh, the scent, like hard, they don't take the, the, the I guess the cool flow is going away. Like in this one on the right-hand side, it's later in the season and the leaf itself isn't as taking the ink as well. But I still kind of love that sort of that, you know, nature that is not, not you know, that almost, it adds the extra layer to, uh, to the image that's happening. Yeah, it's a little collaboration with the, with yeah. the material as well, but it adds obviously to the, yeah. to the image itself. Yeah. yeah. So, so they're actually ingrained in the pictures. These are very temporary things. They're it's, it's, they, now they don't look like this anymore. Um, they Ben Dong had put his in resin, um, but I think those still even faded. So I don't even think the resin was the idea to really save them. But I guess people could collect them in that way, and I wasn't too concerned about people collecting these. Um, yeah. And also, I didn't want to have to explain to my uh, my MFA committee why I use plastic <laughs> in a natural product. So it was like, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it. I, I mounted <laughs> a shadow box for my thesis show. So people, you could smell it. Like you could physically, if you got close enough to the leaf, you could, it was inside a box pinned in there and you could smell it. Mm -hmm. It's okay be waving um, from the wind as what was in the gallery. So, That's um, cool. but unfortunately like they, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're still around, but they're just very different. Um, yeah, they live on in the digital, don't they? Mm -hmm. on... mm -hmm. Yeah, but is it, is it something, is it a process that you, um, did you do kind of you'll keep it locked specifically for this work or is it something like in terms I of I mean for me in, yeah I don't with nature for other things yeah I don't know I mean <laughs> I think I was coming out of grad school and I was super sensitive to criticism <laughs> and the, I mean the criticism was like oh that Ben Don had done this and I was like does Ben Don own core for printing as a process I don't I don't think so but anyway it was because of my work is so like I tend to find processes to fit the content yeah um so unless I had a reason to use it again, like that fit exactly matched the sort of content idea, I wouldn't use it again. Um, I probably would just try to, the next story or project I do, I'll try to find processes that reflect the content to help uh, help reinforce the ideas I'm trying to put forth. Yeah, absolutely. But in some ways I have, right? I have like, I went from core printing to this next project, which is like lumen printing, which is super similar. It's just using digital negatives and black white photo paper. Um, and then using um, different ways of toning um, the images. But also, so I did play it in the dark during COVID where I couldn't photograph anybody else but myself. Um, and I was again thinking about you know, like blackness, what does it mean to be black? What does it mean to be what African-American stuff in photography, the connection and relationship to the things, these ideas of visibility. And this, you know, I just read out Elric Gassant's work about visibility. So I was like, I'm gonna make these pictures that were, it's hard to see, of myself, of my body, that it's hard to see. <laughs> um, so an aluminum printing process was like perfect, perfect for this. And again, it was COVID, so, I only had myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> what was you your know. COVID experience? Were you with people? Or you oh, did you? I mean, I think this project was probably really important cathartic for me because it's like I've, I've never, I, like, essentially these are like new self-studies of my own body, <laughs> which was like, I was a photojournalist. That was, that was never a thing I was ever going to do <laughs> in my life, but it just, 
had myself, I had my body and I was like thinking about skin. And so it just, it was one of those projects where I sort of like conquered my own ego and just sort of like made these pictures that were very much me and all me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had long yeah. hair one time. So, uh, you yeah. Know. And then have you been living with this work? Have you done any, did it, did it see the light of day? Was it, how did you practice? Um, a little bit, a yeah. little bit. Um, like it was in one exhibition, um, a couple like, you know, um, uh, Follow Lucida, and it's going to be like part of it's going to be in the exhibition um, in the fall in Ohio. So it still occasionally is coming out into the world in different ways. Um, so again, at least, and I'm excited about, well, I don't know, I very, I did this work and it's like, I did it, I almost felt like an experiment and it almost like was a proof of concept about visibility. Um, it helped me, it led to other approaches and my most current work too, just using Newman printing as a technique or thinking about visibility um, in these portraits that I made from um, my newer work. But I don't know, I'm still trying to figure out if I can, you know, when people ask me to show it, I usually will um, will, will show it still. Um, but again, it's like one of those things where I could still be working on it. So it could be just simply working on it as well. But I, I get so distracted so quickly at times. <laughs> oh, my next project, I need to go do the next thing. Um, yeah. so I was going to ask you about the... Um, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about the interrupt. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask you about the kind of genesis of projects whilst we're at kind of mid midpoint mm -hmm. of the images, I guess, um, around how you... Because um, some, some artists have projects that last the entirety of their life and others have like kind of shorter projects or others mm -hmm. like how, how long were you working on Appalachian Ghost and I suppose that's yeah. in, in, inevitably when you're working with archives you kind of spot other opportunities for other threads of stories or other oh, narratives yeah. to kind of brew <laughs> alongside that and then how do you temper yeah. yourself in, in managing those those threads of thinking yeah it's it's hard because I could still be working on Appalachian Ghost because there's so many small through lines and ways and to focus it um but i think i spent probably on and off two years working on that and then you know and then i was like well one of the iterations of this head needs to be a book so i want to be able to combine this with this other archive materials and landscapes that i made to sort of like sort of make this not like a testimony but like a thing that can be used to help other people understand what happened in this space but there's always these side projects that are like, oh, I could I could down go spend down a rabbit hole and do a bunch of that, right? I'm sort of going through that now with my most current work, uh, where like I I've done I guess like the idea it's so weird because the idea that I started with wasn't what I finished with, <laughs> you know, it was started here, ended up over here, and there's all these side things that like oh like. I photographed all these curbs. Um, what do I do with that work? Or I'm really interested in sound in this space or, or video in this space too. Like I want to do work as well with that as well. So I'm, you know, it's like, it's a struggle actually <laughs> to like figure out when to leave a thing or maybe like this part is done and I'm going to focus on like these side projects that are related to the project, but separate. Yeah. Um, like I'm trying to get better at just working on single pieces and, I think um, because I was a photojournalist and documentarian, I, I tend to look at everything as like a 20, 40 image thing and not as like an individual piece. I'm still, I'm still trying to, um, like not everything has to be a book. <laughs> like <I'm> trying <laughs> to like find, like I want to work on one thing, one idea. Um, it could be, you know, an idea like either based on a story or an idea that's based on form or content. Um, but I'm having to like learn that yeah and practice how to, how to do that yeah and, that, and how do you manage it do you have a gallery or do you how do you kind of um mm -hmm. bounce your ideas or kind of creative process do you have um people that you count on as mentors do you have who do you have within the realm of, of practice? I think so I mean I have, I have some mentors I don't have a gallery or anything like that I, I try to I have friends that I try to bounce ideas off of I try to get them to ring me in because my ideas are always grand they're so grand they're just huge like i'm gonna and it's weird that how attached to publishing i am because i'm like i want to do a guidebook for this <laughs> <laughs> realizing that that's going to be like an amazing amount of work and a need to gather resources and research uh, that I, I need to do uh, but oftentimes i 
I'm gonna as I do a project, I show people, you know, send them text messages, say, hey, I'm doing this. What do you think? Um, yeah. going back and forth, you know, are you reading the same thing as I'm reading in this picture or a set of pictures as I'm moving through um different processes? Yeah. Um, yeah. And how do you find portfolio reviews in, in the midst of, of that as well? So it's like the banner. That's how we met as well initially. Yeah, I think portfolios are cool. I mean, I'm I I'm very much into this idea of just you know, I like getting feedback, but the meetings are so quick at times um, to fully. And I'm also trying to figure out because my practice is so research based. There's so much of me talking <laughs> <laughs> and the, the battle, the line between text and image, like line between me explaining the work and like letting it be um, like it, my work feels like it needs like, con uh, like a container all the time. So that's why that's why I've gravitated towards the book as a form. Um, so, but I think the reviews themselves have been really, really important to sort of um, get the work out there and to um, make it have relationships with people and, and meet people um, within the industry, especially like I, I'm fairly new to the more fine art side of the photo industry. I, I spent, I mean, like I'm like three years in at this point or three and a half years in. Hmm. Actually, not more than that. That's a lie. I was, <laughs> I, I started in grad school. So I'm more like six, like five-ish years in. That's um nice. typical process but half of it was COVID so I don't know if that counts maybe I'm three years <laughs> <in>. <laughs> um three years then and before that I was in photojournalism which is a completely different ecosystem and in a completely different way in which work is, and relationships are transmitted so um portfolio reviews have been really helpful to help introduce me to, and help me understand um this other the other this other side of the industry yeah um, and I'll complete the, the last project is it's hard to start real to time travel, um, which is going back to the tobacco leaves. Uh, finally, I was able to go to North Carolina and I was able to go to the place in which I had done all this research about and was wondering, like, my family is from this location. And I became really interested in, like, my family story, but there's that's kind of a very short story in, in a sense of what's documents are left for me to to use to look at the landscape so I began to expand beyond my family to like other histories um and I became very fascinated with the history of the maroon and this idea of uh maroons being people who would have escaped slavery but instead of always fleeing north um they would stayed in the landscape where they escaped because of family connections and from there I you know use you know and you can find um, maroonage and within historical documents in, in certain ways and the, the biggest way for me was the runaway slave ad and I began to use those ads um, the locations ads from the locations where I was working to point me to where I went in a landscape um, but and then ultimately I began to just I created a framework for the project around the idea of the portal um, because of uh, African American religion, African American folklore, um, there's these things they talk about: ways of escape, whether through flight or whether through magic, um, ways of navigating the landscape. And essentially, the project was me trying to, uh, you know, figure out how to look at a landscape as if I was a maroon <laughs> in some in cases, or looking for the signs um, that they may have left behind. Um, so this project is primarily. Uh, portrait landscape and text based. Um, there's, there's always, there's, I don't want to dive too deeply, but there's, I'm not doing it dive deeply, but it's like there's lots of layers between um, choices uh, within these images. Um, this is an example of a runaway slave ad, and it's just, you know, the ad is verbatim, but I add my own text to the image, um, and my own point, points of view of looking and wondering. Mm -hmm. like what happened on Tuesday you know yeah so the, the text that's highlighted there do you, are you happy to read that out for anyone who can yeah. see that yeah it says um he was he was last seen heading towards the faint light flickering at the edge of the creek um and it says uh I know that there are magical pathways in the forest remember to keep your eyes open um this is sort of my intervention of the slave ad too because the slave ads are ridiculous <laughs> they're like they're like, this is in the archive itself, like this is the only time that Tuesday gets mentioned it was in this runaway slave ad that was put out by his enslaver um, that describes who he was as a person, like physically, then sometimes they'll have personality traits within them as well. Um, so I wanted to like 
be happy in conversation with that as well, as well as using these to go to whatever creek. Oftentimes they'll say where the person escaped from. And I would try to go to maps and locate those spaces today and then use those as spaces to photograph them as well. Yeah, extraordinarily haunting, powerful images um, as well. Yeah, so this, everything's I, like, you no, know, the titles become important portal and numbers and decimals and, and all this philosophy behind, not huge philosophy, but just like this ideas behind, you know, why I was doing some of these things. Um, this is some of the folklore that talks about like not eating salt so you could fly. Um, and people who ate salt couldn't fly, people who didn't could fly. Um, so this stuff is like super, like, uh, I don't know. It's just oh, if learning learning how to look at the landscape in a different way. This is the first time where I've like, I've been thinking about, am I a landscape photographer now? Like a conceptual landscape photographer. Somehow I became, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's which is a long life. way from being like a human driven, people driven, moment driven photojournalist True. than I was before. But it's, it's heavy, heavy human stories though, no? And it's mm -hmm. human narratives in the, in the landscape and it's un unraveling those. And I was going to say that how you use archives and, and reworking narratives to show I guess or, well mm -hmm. absolutely alternative perspectives on on those histories and more emotive or um yeah obviously like, like you're saying working with the the the, the ads and adding a more yeah, I mean, dimension to those so. yeah it's just I mean the ads are like surveillance in a way and like so much is, I mean, there's also like, I mean, I'm thinking so much surveillance then goes back to like the previous project, which was the Lumen Prince and this idea of um, being seen. Um, and so that project sort of morphed into this project, especially with these portraits, so I can find one, or this idea of like, I wanted to make a super dark portrait that you can still see some features of the person's face, but I wanted them to be sort of merging out of this blackness. I wanted it to make them hard for you to see. I can find one in here that's darker. <laughs> um, harder for you to see the details of, so the faces almost become more landscapey. Um, but then also you have to work to, to see them as well. I think in the, in the PowerPoint, things are a little, a little bit brighter than they would be in, in print form. I see if I can find something that's darker. <laughs> Kind of, you know, you kind of get the picture, but that yeah. idea sort of, you know, came into the project of visibility. And I'm very careful about how I use, I wanted to be very careful about how I use Black bodies in my work for this project. Um, so, like, I just was real specific. So it was, like, landscapes and then, like, these dark, dark images of the, these faces um, that you have to work hard to sort of understand or to, you know, see the details in. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. And and what's what's your intention, I suppose, or, or hope, um, in terms of what the viewer will take away from the kind of combination of images and text and yeah, uh, these kind of revelations of hidden hidden narratives as well. That's a great question. Because <laughs> it's um <laughs> one of it is almost asking like like who's this for? Um uh, or the layers of people who come to it. And like my first audience for it was uh, I guess would be like for me, almost as like my, you know, my son um, or my family who is from this location, um, just so they know um, about just um, like that, what they know that one, the first day they have seen the landscape, which for part of our family comes from, um, they begin to understand like just the power that was in this, this is simply this idea of being able to escape from a, a system and then to live within the space unseen for whatever period of time to feed yourself to shelter um how well you had to know the landscape environment so you had to know your plants you had to know where your food you had to fish you had to know how to swim you had to do all these things you had to be of in, in of nature uh, which was always oh, goes back to like my uh, um the, the the tree work earlier because it was like you know, like this experience of landscape, which seems so divorced from my family, but my family is from that, right? My family were farmers. They were, they did these things. We had a deep connection to nature. Mm -hmm. And at some point that that connection got, was broken. So I think the purpose of the work is 
well, first level, you know, that close family level is like we were like we had a deep connection to nature, like like um like we had a, a, a connection to this landscape and to this space. Other folks, I hope, you know, I think other folks, I'm hoping that they begin to again also see this sort of like that there was this not not just res resiliency, because I hate that word at times, but resiliency, but also like a deep understanding of space that they could navigate it while you're looking for them, but you never found them. <laughs> and there, <laughs> you know, it's just this idea of like of mastery, maybe. Um out of in a place where we wouldn't think there was mastery within this this idea of slave savory or um hmm. yeah it's incredible alternative narratives of yeah. that to, to share forward and also of course it's um like current political and social moments as well isn't it kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. supporting people to learn learn more in depth and build empathies and have more detail of of, of uh, how to how to read the land and engage with it as well mm -hmm. um can you talk about, I suppose, the curation of this kind of work? Super challenging to combine the uh, images, the archives, yeah. the text. There's yeah. some text laden as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no, it's yeah. it is it is it's like a uh, again. I think when I first started this project, I was like, and maybe it's like a weakness of mine. I was like, book. <laughs> I was like, false. <laughs> um, I always imagined it to be a book because I knew that text was going to be an important part. I knew um, I wanted to have captions, not necessarily with the pictures, but someplace in the book that sort of explained these locations and what they're, how they're connected to each other. I'm combining black and white and color, um, portrait and landscape and text. Um, in this, in this, in this way of navigating through space, also with maps, right? Too that show you some of these liminal spaces of where the maroons who constantly yeah. could be in. So it, for me, it's always been, but it's sort of like this idea of like remix, which is I think also thinking about like this African American like hip hop culture and this idea of overlapping appropriated sources and overlapping various disparate materials together. Um, to create uh, a new ways of reading and understanding like history and culture. Yeah. Uh, which I think is, I think deeply in sort of African-American experience and also like part of like a quote unquote black aesthetic um, that was trying to tap with these disparate things of an overlapping nature of, of, of the work. Yeah. And that really comes across as well, and, but it's also super generous to, to be sharing so much detail, like you say, kind of like the layers of the maps and really positioning mm -hmm. and grounding and the roots, roots of the soil of the place. And mm -hmm. um, the exhibition that I saw in Houston had, um, you know, I was kind of quite intrigued in terms of like the positioning of the works and how, mm -hmm. how works lay opposite each other, even, you know, where your sight lines are and yeah. how, you, how you position, how you physically install the text and other things. Is that, um, yeah, really incredible to encounter physically the exhibition as well out of the book <laughs> um yeah yeah awesome. no the, the exhibition is like the next big the big adventure for me for the project is how do I think the, the Houston work was the first time photo fest was the first time that the work had been um exhibited at all so um I was like okay this is a, like an experiment of having these faces across from these big prints and I was like, could these prints be bigger? Could these? I'm not, I was, was getting more ideas about how to potentially um, go at it in the future with some of the work, and maybe even eventually bringing in sound as well for installation purposes. So I'm actually, I am returning back to North Carolina to record sound specifically, um, to be in, and then to think about how to make those work together eventually. But um, yeah. yeah, it's it's very, it's still like that. If I and if I was still working on this project, I am essentially trying to figure out how to um, install it. <laughs> yeah. Um, to continue to grow that. Yeah. I hope you find an amazing space for that. Me too. But I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> hopefully, I'm like, I don't know. It's 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 weird to be a maker of stuff because it's you always kind of feel like a. Um, what's the word? You feel like a. Not, fraud is not the word, but <laughs> you feel like, what are you like? What are you doing? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> like, and I'm doing this for a long enough time where I should not feel that way anymore. But I always no. I feel like it's never that sort of like 
am I crazy feeling almost never goes away yeah uh, it's, it's a motivation at the end of the day isn't it I was just yeah. going to talk about I suppose it kind of a uh, sort of theme that we talk a lot about here at, at PhotoWorks around failure I suppose as as mm -hmm. part of your artistic practice can you mm -hmm. failure is a commonality um and how do you practice your resilience in relation to you know sustaining your motivation and moving forward in, in your work obviously you'll get setbacks and rejections and frustrations throughout time isn't yes. it how, how do you manage <laughs> <laughs> relentless the, the nice no letter that we all yeah with, so it? many of those i should yeah. I should paste our walls with all the all the no's for various but uh yeah i i mean it's it's fascinating like within the work itself it's I don't know. I mean, I mean, I make thousands of photographs, you know, and like most of them aren't very good. And also, it's like when you're like trying something else, like, and for me, it was like, how do I, you know, go from uh, people centered images to landscape photographs? Like, I don't, I mean, I don't know how to make a landscape photograph. So I'm having to like sort of make myself vulnerable. Um, a large part of this process was like how do I look at landscape how to look at this landscape <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing and I made a lot of bad pictures in that process I thought um until like I finally that one day something clicked in my head and I was like this is how I should do this but it was a a, a process of not really knowing what I was doing for um quite a while or at least the maybe I didn't have the framework or something that really began to direct my eye when I was looking at at the mm -hmm. landscape in a lot of ways but it's so much um failure is like so important too because that's really the only way you can grow you know in a lot of ways it's weird I mean I kind of look at my photojournalism career as almost as a, as a failure <laughs> like because in my head I never like I was going to be like a staffer at the New York Times by the time I was like 25 <laughs> you know <laughs> was where I was going you know and I was making these pictures and Mostly I was just doing everything, doing the thing I thought I was supposed to do. Um, but at some point, um, I really didn't begin to see a little bit of success until I really, um, really started to follow my heart and go after the things I was actually interested in and the things that could sustain me. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, like I'd be shooting stuff in this photojournalist that I didn't really care about. Um, I cared about it. I could, I could do it for a week. I could do it for two. And then boredom would set in. Like it was so important to find projects that I could spend years on um, yeah. that kept me curious for a long time. Like if I could spend two years working on a project then that's a project I need to be doing with my personal work. Um, yeah. If not, then you know, who's if you don't care, no one else is going to care. Yeah, correct. that's absolutely true, isn't it? Um, and I, I guess kind of reflecting back on your very long three to four to five year <laughs> um, mm -hmm. practice within this kind of creative creative um a focused part of your career is there any any kind of advice you would have given yourself now kind of looking back at then when you were starting out right it's it's hard because uh I've, part of me like you should have went to art school sooner but then I would not be who I am today <laughs> like um you know I I thought if I would have came I think I, I when I first started I really was more I was more for artists at heart but like I was afraid of like not um no not being my parents like what are you what job are you gonna have like there's no job as an artist <laughs> but I could I could be a photojournalist saying the job on the paper and I sort of did that because it was a safe way for me to be uh creative um but I'm also I, I don't know there's so many things in life that are trying to trying to pull you away from it and I don't it's not like perseverance um and I think I, was, I would keep telling myself that like Honestly, my advice to myself is would be more of not less advice and more of like almost like a comforting phrase of like you're not crazy, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a like, very good advice, though. No, yeah, it's <laughs> very like, good you know, because... support. No, mm -hmm. that's a brilliant, brilliant supportive mantra. Yeah, because the yeah. whole world is, I feel like, is trying to like you can't do this for so many reasons why you can't do it. Um, you should be doing something else, or you need to get a job and. And part of me, I, I almost wish I was a banker or I'd become a doctor engineer. I'd be much more financially better off. <laughs> but <laughs> all those years into it at this point, like I don't think I was ever supposed to do anything else. And yeah. I'm glad like I didn't get scared away. Yeah, we're really pleased you didn't. And uh, 
happy that you, you keep on going keep, yeah, keep, yeah. You know, keep that mantra alive um just to bring us back into um because as uh, we should probably wrap up um okay. but yeah really super um wonderful to 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 talk with you and, and hear more about your practice were there any more of the slides that you wanted to go through just before oh we yeah no finish? i think yeah. on the very last we were like to like this one like yeah. where I, my body enters the, the the picture for the first and only time in the project <laughs> <laughs> perfect and my search for the portal so i think i think that was that was it oh per that, perfect that timing um yeah. and where 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 are you heading after this after this meeting today i am driving to morgantown west virginia for a book review book signing tonight and talk doing that for the week and then i'm preparing for um a portfolio and stuff to take the arles and preparing to go to france yeah fantastic so, i look forward to seeing you there yeah, um, and thank you so much it's, it's been really incredible to um, expand on your work together and um, I look forward to seeing um, the rest of your um, residency with us and yes, to yes. wherever your career takes you next. Um, I'll be following your work with um, full curiosity and enthusiasm awesome. as you go yeah. through. Thank you so much. No, I'm so much. super excited. I'm super glad to have a chance to have a conversation. I look forward to seeing you, seeing you in Arles. Brilliant. Thank you so yeah. much. Right.